As Curry strives for the treble, these were the messages for West today from the town's butcher and baker, while the confident candlestick maker was already selling shirts heralding the hat trick. Not a for sure thing, but I'd say they've got a very good chance here. Yeah. The shirts were turning over more cash on the town's corner than a bookie on Melbourne Cup Day. You see, this town isn't expecting any rough rides come Sunday when the bulldog scowl will turn to a smile. While the Curry streets were decked out in red, white and blue, the most amazing scenes were down here at the local school, where you could have been forgiven for thinking that the Bulldogs had already won the Premiership. With the Curry Club song providing the backdrop, the school had one of its more unusual recess breaks, with the players stealing the show. Most had dressed for the occasion, some had written poems for the team, while others chose song to display their feelings. Back at West, things were more subdued, but just as confident about their chances come Sunday. Police today retraced the steps of a woman who was attacked while she was in the amenities block at the Water Wonderland Caravan Park at Soldiers Point on Wednesday night. The police say it was a cowardly attack. The man beat his victim about the head while she was in the shower. I consider it to be very vicious. She's received uh, fairly substantial head injuries and um, presently is uh, receiving treatment. The Central Coast woman was left for dead. She has a fractured skull and is in a serious condition in the John Hunter Hospital. The man responsible for the attack is described as tall and thin with dark curly hair. Police are interviewing Caravan Park residents for any leads. They've warned people in the area to take care. That if anyone is using the amenities of any caravan park within the area, that uh, they take a, a special care. Um, and uh, if possible to have a relative go with them and go in pairs until we can uh, solve this business. Anyone with information should contact Nelson Bay Police on 049 811 244. Jane Anderson, NBN News. The truck left a path of destruction after the driver lost control on a sweeping bend of the New England highway at about three this morning. The semi-trailer hit the gutter and tipped on its side, sliding for more than 30 metres along the footpath. When we came to the front door, we have seen that the semi-trailer had been overturned and was laying on its side with it right up against our wall of the shop. The truck took out shop awnings along the way, sliding within metres of a newsagent, a house and an old butchery. Rescue crews were called in, including the Fire Brigade's hazardous materials unit. The truck's load included paints and methylated spirits. Somehow, the 33-year-old truck driver from Katingle near Tamworth walked away from the crash. The driver uh, received minor injuries, cuts and abrasions and several bruises. He was taken to Musclebrook Hospital uh, by ambulance. The New England highway was blocked for more than nine hours as crews cleaned up the mess. And in a separate incident, a 26-year-old man was killed in a fiery truck crash this morning. The semi-trailer carrying a load of aluminium ran off the road and burst into flames on the Hume Highway south of Goulburn. Seven players in Sunday's starting side for West were part of the 93 grand final loss to Curry, the start of recent rivalry and a memory which still lingers. Since then, like um, playing each other, it's always brought out the best in both teams and, and really this um, grand final was pretty much predicted since the start of the season. To get there, both sides have met three times, West winning on two occasions, each producing plenty of intensity, which is likely to flare again on Sunday. I think whichever side can, can cop that, maybe might come out on top. 
West certainly did in the major semi, which was the minor premier's only game in a month, which their coach believes won't detract from their performance. There's obviously a lot of opinion about that. Um, I don't know, Sunday will tell. In contrast, Curry has had yet another arduous path to the grand final, but as they've shown in the past, they thrive on being the underdog. Our 13 guys, probably all of them are carrying a niggling injury, but grand final will bring the best out in them and hopefully you know, they'll do the job. Like most premiership deciders, the individual confrontations will also be a highlight, none better than that between the Rakes, Tony Hutton and Phil Williams. Yeah, he played very well in the major semi and he played very well at Harker too, so we've got to watch him and uh, we've just got to watch the whole forward pack. In local grades, Lakes take on Maitland in reserves and in thirds, West play the Seagulls. The first of five heats started this afternoon, the titles also incorporating the fifth round of the state off-road championships. 100 drivers started the race with Cooler's Neil Morrison taking out the opening event, while Singleton's Graham Baxter heads the four-wheel drive division into tonight's second stage. Meantime, the Falcons take on the Magic in Melbourne tonight, chasing their first away victory against the club since 1985. The Falcons upset them in Newcastle just two weeks ago and are coming off a comfortable win against Hobart last night. The Falcons beat the Devils by eight points. Tony Jensen still one shy of the thousand tally in the NBL. Reggie Smith was again outstanding in the scrappy affair, hitting 16 points and grabbing 18 rebounds. After defeating Hobart on Friday night, the Falcons led for the duration against the Magic and had seven players all scoring ten points or more, including Tony Jansen who brought up his 1,000 in the NBL. Newcastle hit a remarkable 47% of its three-point shots, bettering their effort from the field. Reggie Smith had an absorbing battle with John Dorge, grabbing another 14 rebounds and 22 points. The 14-8 win-loss record has the Falcons in a four-way tie for second. A playoff place assured, they'll now look to maintain a top-four spot with home games against Hobart, Adelaide and Geelong. A National Parks Draft Management Plan recommends cutting foreshore access to vehicles around One Mile and Samurai Beaches. It's a popular and unique area used by many different interest groups, including surfers, fishermen, four-wheel drive owners and nudists. A broad cross-section of people turned out in an attempt to persuade National Parks to help preserve a way of life as well as protect the coast. Petitions to the Government and the National Parks and Wildlife Service were circulated. Most beach users agreeing that a compromise can be reached. We've put forward a range of strategies uh, which we believe will allow vehicles to still access the traditional recreational places within the park, but in fact will also uh, protect the environment as well. Some holiday businesses, including a backpacker hostel, trade on the idea that the area is unique in that it offers beach access through a national park. This national park is one that people have uh, traditionally used for recreational activities for, for more than a hundred years and it's a vital part of uh, many people's lives in this area and we have people from all over Australia and even from overseas coming to enjoy the recreational activities in Tomaree National Park.
A weekend of high spirits and two young lives ended in this small shattered sedan just before midnight. The car belonged to Terry Chipperfield, Maitland's reserve grade fullback, a club captain with more than 100 games to his credit. Terry would have turned 25 today. A passenger in the car, 19-year-old Daniel Sharnock from Brankston, was also killed when it slammed into a power pole, splintering the timber and bringing down lines. To think that they were on a high all day yesterday, they almost won the grand final. We were proud of them even though they didn't win it, they fought right till the end and Lakes only got on top in the last few minutes. And we had a few celebrations back at the club with some food and a few drinks and everyone was quite happy and off they went home. And then this happened. Daniel Sharnock had only come into the team this season after good performances in the under-18s. He'd also been picked in the Newcastle Knights Jersey flag side and played well in yesterday's reserve grade final against Lakes in Newcastle. Some of the team had gone on last night to a party at Terry Chipperfield's house and it was just a few doors up the road that the fatal crash happened. We feel so sorry for the parents and the families but also for the players because they were like one big happy family. And, and for us too, because we absolutely love them. I've been with them for four years, watched them grow up, and um, well, just as if I've lost one of my own, or two of my own boys. Amazingly, Anthony Stewart began his Newcastle grade career as a batsman. It wasn't until he was 19 and playing for Charlestown that his bowling came to the fore. The quick taking two for 41 against the West Indies for Australian country in 1993. He then went to Sydney to play with Ramwick, taking on Newcastle in the state one day final at the SCG. But the following season he was back at the hallowed turf, making his Shield debut. My first game walked onto the SCG against uh, West Australia for the first game. It's probably the biggest thrill I've had in sport. The Blues' dismal season and shortage of genuine pace bowlers has given Stewart a chance to blossom under former Test spearhead and now Blues coach Jeff Lawson. His selection in the 13-man squad to tour England, which includes Test players, is a measure of the regard he's held in. To play with the, you know, the likes of Steve War and, and Mark and, and uh, Mark Taylor and, and so on, you know, it was obviously a big thrill for me. Uh, you know, just to probably you know bowl with with Glenn McGrath. You know, he's the opening bowler for Australia. You know, I've got to maybe pick up a few tips from him. And if he holds his place, he'll once again take the new ball against the West Indies in front of his home crowd at Number One Sports Ground in December. This time for New South Wales. Brian Leslie Smith walked out of Newcastle Supreme Court a free man. The jury acquitted him of murdering his nephew Darren Spradbrough. Spradbrough's body was found buried under logs on Smith's property at Yarrowich near Warhope last year. On the day the murder allegedly took place, Smith says he was at the Burwood Hotel in Sydney passing on a message about a drug deal for a friend. So I never did anything and I never, I had nothing to feel guilty about. And um, when the jury saw it, it didn't take them a real long time to work it out. After Spradbro's mother, Carol Bridge, and his sister, Deborah Schneider, heard the jury's not guilty verdict, they confronted Smith, who was celebrating with his family and lawyers at the nearby Grand Hotel. A wild brawl broke out. The two women attacked Brian Smith, beating him and ripping his shirt apart. In front of a crowded room, Carol Bridge threatened to kill him. They also physically attacked Smith's lawyer, Glenn Ferguson. 
Outside the pub, Carol Bridge insisted she wasn't angry about the decision. No, I'm not angry. I'm just hurt. During the trial, a witness, Peter William Dykes from Fredericton, told the court that while he was at Smith's property in March last year, he saw Smith use a bulldozer to push logs over a body. Although Smith has now gone free, Dykes earlier pleaded guilty to concealing a serious offence and will serve 300 hours of community service. Jane Anderson, NBN News. After 28 years, the 7,000th episode of Romper Room went to air today. In that time, the program has had four hosts. The first was Miss Anne. Next, the show was hosted by Miss Louise, but the longest running presenter is Miss Kim, who's notched up 19 years. I think it's always refreshed by the children, because the children come in, we have a different set of children for every program, and uh, they're always, well, you've got different personalities all the time. Romper Room was an American concept, which in its early days was telecast in 39 countries. Thirty-eight thousand children have appeared on NBN's version of the show and they're still queuing up, with a 12-month waiting list for children aged four. Firefighters have already been given a hint of what might be in store. A spate of grass fires around Newcastle yesterday saw crew members working late into the night. There were a few minor outbreaks today. Although today's overcast sky promised a few drops, it didn't deliver, with the Williamtown weather station confirming a record-breaking dry spell. In 1970, there was no rainfall for 40 days. Newcastle is now into its 41st consecutive dry day. The last fall was 0.4 of a millimetre in late June. The mercury was pleasantly sitting around the early 20s today, but there are forecasts of a return to warmer temperatures. Most councils, including Newcastle, Singleton and Port Stephens, will start the bushfire period next week. Mary War, Musselbrook and Maitland authorities still have the date set for October 1st. Local firefighting crews are preparing for what could be a long dry summer. Katrina Hines, NBN News. Four thousand entries were submitted to Australia's funniest home video show screened on NBN. The winner was from this family, Bright and Breezy.
Today, the Herft family from Carryong was presented with a cheque for $50,000. We're going to pay this beautiful house off here. <laughs> That's the best part of it. Get rid of the mortgage. And of course, buy the girls something special as well. Jane Anderson, NBN News. The half a million dollar landscape plan is part of the federal government's Building Better Cities program. It's being designed to complement landscape work already carried out along Hannell Street as part of the Honeysuckle project. More than 350 jacarandas, eucalypts, melaleucas and casuarinas will be planted around Carrington, Wickham, Maryville and Islington with the help of landcare groups. Lending a hand to launch the scheme were representatives from all levels of government. And there's been another addition to the city's illumination program. The old lights on the Civic Park fountain haven't worked for the past six years, but a new set of halogen lamps have given it a special glow. Along with Fort Scratchleaf, City Hall, the Obelisk and the Cathedral, the 25-year-old landmark will shine every night of the week until 10pm. Melinda Smith, NBN News. Service station franchise owners headed for Sydney today, rallying against what they believe are plans by oil companies to push them around. According to the operators, the foreign-owned Shell has already taken back control of 100 outlets, selling its products throughout the state and has plans to envelop around 150 more. In the Hunter, 20 or 30 outlets may all come under the control of a single Shell franchise, rather than being run by independent operators. They claim prices could skyrocket. Shell management was unavailable for comment. Other oil companies are also believed to be reconsidering franchise arrangements. Independent operators are calling on the government to apply a moratorium on takeovers until an industry inquiry can be carried out. Fresh from his civic reception yesterday, Singleton's Wallaby Steve Merrick was one of several interested onlookers at today's game. Down 7-0, the Waratahs climbed their way back into the match with an incisive run from 5'8 David Toomey, which was finished off by Doug Pickering for a one-point lead at the break. The Waratahs maintained the advantage in the second term to set up a meeting with Singleton next week. In hockey, University continued its impressive march towards the Newcastle semi-finals this afternoon. The Premiers thrashed Maitland 8-1 with West taking on Norse tomorrow. To netball and Gazza's sports will play Brewers in the Newcastle Grand Final next weekend. Gazza's won this afternoon's final, beating Charlestown 34 to 24. And in surfing, the regional school's final got underway in small but clean conditions at South Newcastle. With most heats completed today, the finals will be staged tomorrow.
The four-year-old, emulating its win in the Sandown Guineas and successful on its first run for trainer Gerald Ryan. Western Red was second and an impressive return for Jeune to finish third. To Sydney where the three-year-olds were doing battle in the Peter Pan Stakes over 1,500 metres at Rose Hill. Mick Dippen riding his first winner in Sydney for some months on the 11 to 8 on favourite. Stork was second and Recalcitrant's third. Life doesn't deal everyone an even start, but often real strengths of character emerge along the way. For some, that might have meant finishing a 10-kilometre charity walk around the shore of Lake Macquarie and attending a picnic to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the House With No Steps in this area. I'm Alison Green. I'm here from the House With No Steps. And how's your day going? Excellent. It's good to get out on a day like this? Yes, it is. Are you looking forward to getting around to the park? I can't wait. My mum's over there and my family going to support me. That's the way they'll be proud when you get in? Yep. The House With No Steps is now looking to establish aged and respite care hostels as well as providing independent living training. Originally it was set up to help disabled people find employment and activities. And to share um, their loneliness I suppose because there was a lot of people that were with disabilities who had no opportunity to go anywhere or do anything. They were sort of in the back room and mum and dad never took them out. You know? So the House With No Steps opened up wide horizons for people uh, with uh, disabilities. Andrew Lobb, NBN News. The Citizens Group launched its policy in the city today outlining plans to cut rates, establish a sports centre at National Park and attract jobs to Newcastle. We have to have business. Uh, small business in Australia is the biggest provider of work. Sure, we have to have that. But we can't have business or development at any cost. It's got to be environmentally sustainable. It has to be in done in sympathy with its surroundings. The group hopes to capitalise on a left-wing shift in the traditional complexion of the Labor Party that has seen long-standing figureheads dumped in preference of new party candidates. We've got to try and wrench that control to our group. Uh, we're not a political group. Uh, I don't believe uh, party politics has any place in local government. Um, we have a conscience vote. We don't caucus. Each member of uh, uh, our group is allowed to vote as he or she thinks is, be is best in the best interests of Newcastle. Newcastle solicitor Morgan Jones heads nine candidates who hope to return the citizens group to power, reminiscent of the days of McDougal and Purdue, two of the city's longest serving Lord Mayors. Ahead 2-1, Hamilton's Harry James received a yellow card and was then sent off after a heated exchange with the referee. Edgeworth immediately took advantage, producing the equaliser through Andrew Tonks, who was making his return to first grade. The Eagles scored two quick goals early in the second term to secure the match and a hat-trick to Tonks. In Rugby Union, Waratah Mayfield has eliminated Wanderers from the competition with a 27-17 victory this afternoon. The only try of the second term was scored by halfback Matthew Carney after some sustained pressure. The boot of Chad Watt also proved decisive, May East repelling everything to book a meeting with Meriwether Carlton next weekend. In hockey, West Stephen Deering has had a far from memorable 300th match for the club. North down West 8-1, Andrew Cox scoring five goals.